Okay. Don't go anywhere. Just go Okay. Okay. It is Wednesday, June 26. We are going to pick up in Revelation 21, and we're going to start with verse 5, but we're going to just uh, do a real quick review from the start of the chapter because we are in a whole new place. And if you were here last class, you know what a blessing it is. We're leaving behind all of the yuck, all of the gore, all of the murder, all of the mayhem, all of the everything is gone now. We have passed the tribulation. We have passed the rebellion after the millennial kingdom. We have passed the great white throne judgment. We have passed them being cast into hell. Now we get to focus on all of the glory. And what a wonderful place to be. Y'all deserve it. You've been with me, some of you, for years to get to this point. Now we get to feast, and we are feasting on our eternity for the future. We are already into what is called the new heaven and the new earth. We looked last week, so I'm not going to go into it. Uh, just remind you that from the Hebrew and from the Greek, we saw that it is new. It, it's not something that's existed for a long time in the past. It's something that God made new and fresh, uh, created it again. The, the word creation is in there. We talked about the old needing to be done away with, the why it needed to be done away with. So if you don't know, go back to the last lesson and you'll get it there. I don't want to take time today because I want us to move forward. Um, we saw that uh, the sea is gone. We discussed what that meant. It's not devoid of water, but the sea being, being a prison house of fallen angels, etc. Other reasons, we saw that it is gone. And we saw that what is, we're uh, being told about in verse 2, the holy city, is the new Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem. That this is the home of the bride. The bride is the body of Messiah. The church is another name given to it today, the called out assembly. It's also the home for the Old Testament saints. It's also the home for angels. We saw all that from different scriptures we looked at last time. And then especially important for today's class is we saw that the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. Two points that we're bringing out from that is that it already existed. This was not something new created. This was existing in heaven, but it is not all of heaven, or all of God's heaven even. It was in God's heaven. But we're going to see that, well, and I just named to you, that that, that heaven is still home to many, to angels, to uh, people. Uh, so that we, we want to understand this is only a part that has come out, and it's come out for a reason. It's coming down out of the heaven, and it's uh, described in verse 2 like a bride, in, in the sense that a bride gusses herself up, makes herself as beautiful as possible to, be, to present herself to her husband. Well, we know who our husband is. We know the bridegroom is Yeshua, our Messiah, Jesus. And we know that, that he has clothed us with his robe of righteousness, so we're beautiful in his eyes, but he has also prepared this gorgeous, gorgeous um, new Jerusalem, this home for the bride. We looked at verse 3 about the loud voice that came out of heaven, and we saw our word, behold, in there again, did we not? Yes. I think it was in verse 3. And remember, behold, 30 times in the book of Revelation, and it catches our attention every time. It's something God really wants to get across to us. And what is he getting across to us? And I love this verse. This is the summation of what God wanted for mankind all the way back. If I took you to the very first man and said, what was God's purpose with the first man? We're finally seeing it fulfilled now at this point, and that is the fact that he tabernacles with him. Tabernacling, dwelling, together. This is, um, there's another word I wanted, it escaped me. Oh, that it's like he pitched his tent. Remember the tabernacle first was a tent? So the idea that, that God is dwelling right there and man is right there. That's so intimate. It is so close that you should be feeling it inside of you because the Holy Spirit tabernacles in you right now. And we're told when Yeshua, yeah, he got Eric excited, I love it. And when we see Yeshua walk on this earth, we were told in the beginning was the word. Okay, that takes us all the way back to Bereshit, first one, in the beginning. In the beginning was the word. With the word was with God, the word was God. And then when we came down to verse 14, the word tabernacle dwelt among men. The tabernacle it is that same intimacy. It's that pitching of the tent. We know that Yeshua came down in body. He took on yeah. human form. He did that for us to make that communion, communion um, 
available to us, that, that relationship available to us, because we would not be able to go in the presence of our holy God had he not become man and pay our penalty, open that door for us. So we see all of that. We're finally to that point that what God wanted from his very first human creation is finally going to be true forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. And ever and ever and ever. <laughs> and ever. <laughs> and that's already passed also. I told Roger I didn't need the chart today. I'll just do the little one. Maybe I should have put up the chart, but yes. We're talking about the New Jerusalem. We're seeing it hovering over above the millennial. But we need to take this and move it over to here where we're talking right now because we've gone past the millennium, past the Gog and Magog, the rebellion, past the great white throne judgment where the unsaved were judged for their works and cast into the lake of fire and we're into what's called eternity future. Okay, so we're off our chart now. This is all rolled up. That's why I said the heavens are rolled up. It's all rolled up. But now we are in, uh, looking at the New Jerusalem, and I did bring it out. I gave a sneak peek last time. I was going to bring it out later, but I'll go ahead and bring it out right now. We'll talk about it today. But what you saw on the chart, here's a, a 3D. I love 3D. I love a hands-on tangible for us. We will talk about all of that as we go on through today. Um, just that a neat little object lesson, is it not? What do you call it? The New Yerushalayim. <laughs> if you didn't hear it, she asked what, what, what do I call it? I call it the New Jerusalem because that's what it is. This is our home. We're going to read about our home. You're getting ahead of me now. That's why I wasn't going to bring it up till later. But I'll add it to you. Before we get there, though, we've got the Lord, our God Himself, tabernacling with us. We understand. That it was for Israel. Israel would be forever. I think we looked at that last time. Did we? I think we did. I hope we did. Let me just hit the end of verse 3 in case where it says, uh, okay, where am I? Uh, and God, okay. God is among men. He will dwell among them and they shall be his people and God himself will be among them. Maybe we didn't look at it, but let me just say from the, the Greek, when it's written in the Greek, it talks about peoples, nations. We know that would be true in the Hebrew also if we had the Hebrew script. And I'll give the reference in case if we didn't look at it last week. Isaiah, Yeshua, 66, 22. That's speaking about Israel in the future, in eternity future, not Israel in the millennium. Many, many, many of our scriptures talk about Israel in the millennium, the promises that are there. We know Israel is a nation in the millennium. We know there are other nations because it talks about the nations coming up to Jerusalem so that they will get right. Isaiah 66, 22. You know what? Let's go look at it. If it's review, we learn by review anyway. We're not, and I, I won't get bogged down. I promise you we'll keep moving into new material. If I can find it, who took Yeshia out of my Bible. <laughs> okay, I am in my Jewish Bible and I've got to get to there is our major prophets. 66, verse 22. Almost the end of the book. Almost the end of the book. And when we get to verse 22 of chapter 66, we read, For just as the new heavens and the new earth. How did I get that, that we're in the eternity future? Because of what it just said right there. The new heavens and the new earth, so I know that we are all the way over here off of our chart now. We're in the new heavens and the new earth. That's why I can say so dogmatically, this is not Israel during the millennium. Because the Bible says that, not because Rochelle says that. <laughs> okay, so, and I lost my place. Here we go. It's just as the new heavens and the new earth that I am, am making, or I will make, will continue in my presence, so Adonai, says Adonai. I'm trying to get this too fast. So will your descendants and your name continue. You know, I really don't remember doing this last week, so let me make sure I do make it clear to you. I didn't. Okay, and then we need to pick up at verse 4. We'll change that, and we'll pick up at verse 4, because this is really important. And what is your question? My question mm -hmm. is, how do you pronounce S-H? Um, apostrophe K. Shekinah. 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 That's the glory of God. The Shekinah. Yes. Yeah. And it was really not, well, his presence is his glory. But when it talks about the glory of God, it's always that word Shekinah. The Shekinah glory of God. The essence, the light, the 
is very big is the Shekinah glory. And when it says it's the Shekinah glory of God, that's Yeshua Jesus because he's the express image of God. That's Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 especially that to get a foundation right there. But I can take you all the way back through many scriptures there in Shemot and Exodus <coughs> and other places where it talks about the glory of the Lord, especially in relation to filling the tabernacle or the temple. And when it talks about the glory of the Lord filling the new temple in the millennium, at this time it, it talks about the Shekinah glory going through the eastern gate, which would be blocked up until the glory of the Lord goes through it, the Shekinah glory of the Lord. That eastern gate is cemented up to this day. They cemented it up for another reason. God had his reason. That's funny. It, it is. It is. And all the other gates are not cemented up like this. But this one is cemented up and closed. And because God said no one else will go through it until the glory of the Lord goes through. And his glory will. And then he'll set up the millennial kingdom. The millennial temple has the glory of the Lord filled. That's in chapters 40 to 47 of Ezekiel, Ezekiel. But now we're moving into this time. We're not in the millennial temple. We're, li we're in the new heavens and the new earth. But God is saying, even when I make a new earth, Israel, I'm not doing away with you. Remember how God said, I will never make a full end of you? Well, if he made a full end of Israel here, if there's no Israel to go into the new future, the new eternity, the new heavens and the new earth, <laughs> then he doesn't keep his word. Because he didn't say forever ends at this line. Forever is forever. <laughs> and just the same way that we don't understand this beginning. When did this start? It didn't. <laughs> it always was. Do we understand that? No. No. <laughs> Does that bother us? No. no. Do you want a God you can understand? If so, then you can create them. You can carve them. You can play with them. No. 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 I, I don't want a God that is no better than mine. And sorry, or my it is a kid on brain. God is magnanimous self. He is ineffable. There's my word again. It's an ineffable character. He has always been. And when he says there will always be an Israel, there will always be an Israel. So Isaiah here is telling us in that new heavens, in that new earth, Adonai, the Lord is saying, your descendants, Israel, your name will continue. God keeps his word. We can take it to the bank. Get a check, cash it. He's got his name on the account. And in his account, what do you need? What do you need? We're going to look at how beautiful our home is. But you know what? Gold is our most precious commodity here on this earth. And it's asphalt in heaven. <laughs> it's under the feet in heaven. <laughs> Amazing. And that's it. Just beginning. Just wait till I get to some of these nuggets today. <laughs> Let me show you another proof, and then I'll take you back to Revelation. But on your way back, go to Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel 37. And we are going to look, yes, it's the chapter of the dry bones. Very good, whoever said that. I think that was more at it. Yeah, yeah. Good for you. We're going to verse 21. Okay? Now, this is a time... Israel future from when Hezekiel wrote it, but this is already, we know they're back in the land, but not with the Spirit of God in them. So this is not talking yet about the future that chapter 66 is, but I want you to see the difference. Verse 21 of chapter 37, Then say to them, the Adonai Elohim, the Lord God says, I will take the people of Israel from among the nations where they have gone, gather them from every side, and bring them back to their own land. See, that's something familiar, too. They're coming back to the same place. That place called Israel on our map today was Israel on the map back in Hezekiel's day. Regardless of the maps that the Arab countries make today that don't even acknowledge that Israel existed. No, I'm sorry. It's been there. It's been there all the way back. We have the borders given in their sheet in Genesis. We have the borders given of it, and it's huge. It takes in some of the other nations, but we won't go into that right now. Um, where am I? I'm in verse 21. <laughs> Did I read all 21? I did. Yes. Drop down to verse 26. In verse 26 we read, 
I will make a covenant of peace with them. Now, notice what kind of covenant. Temporary? No. 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 Everlasting. Yes. Or you might have eternal covenant. I will give to them, increase the number, set my sanctuary among them. How long? Forever. 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 What did we just talk about? The new Jewish lion? And did we talked about God tabernacling. We talked about the fulfillment, what he wanted with the creation. <coughs> we saw in Revelation 21 3 that he's tabernacling with them. And now that we read in Isaiah, Isaiah 66, that Israel's in that new heavens and the new earth where we see the fulfillment. His tabernacling with them forever is making an everlasting covenant of shalom, of peace forever. Israel has a bright, glorious, beautiful future, and we're going to be the witnesses to it. We're going to see it, because remember, that's our home, too. Okay, so this is beautiful. Let me go on. My home will be with them. I will be their God. They will be my people. Do you know how long God's wanted that? And they are that way for a bit of time, and then unfaithful back and forth and back and forth. Many of you are parents. Maybe you've got a rebellious child. Gets back right, acts good for a while, then takes <coughs> off again. You know how heartbreaking that is, but you never stop loving them, do you? God said, I love Israel forever, that they will be my people, and I will be their God forever. Verse 28, the nations will know that I am Adonai, who sets Israel apart as holy, when my sanctuary is with them forever. So when he's tabernacling with Israel forever, guess what? There's other nations too, aren't there? Because we've just read that. So there is a future and a hope for others. But we know God's main focus is in relation to Israel is what he is teaching and telling us through the, uh, this study that we have through the Word of God and through the revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach, of Jesus the Messiah, in relation to to his promises to the people who will finally be in right fellowship with him. Finally tabernacle, finally dwell together, finally be in the tent together in that glory forever. I love it. Forever. And God will be their God. I don't think they could be any more beautiful words. God will be their God. They will be his people. Okay, with that in mind, go back to Revelation, where the, uh, going back to chapter 21, that sneak peek, go to verse 24. Go down toward the bottom of the chapter first, and then we'll come back up to where we are. In verse 24, we read, the nations will walk by its light. Now, we're talking about the New Jerusalem. That's, that's come out of heaven. Okay, we know he's made new heavens and new earth, that God's heaven where God dwells, the heaven that we saw in Revelation chapter 5 and, and other locations, this is what came out of that heaven, and this is what he is saying in relation to this, that the nations are going to walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. So there's an earth, we know there's a new earth, we know that the kings are going to come from that earth into this, we know that this in some way is going to be light to that nation. So in essence, for our understanding, we could say this is their son, S-U-N, okay? The, the first new son. Now, we'll find out when we study it how it is light, okay? You may know ahead, but if you don't, stay tuned. And if you do, stay tuned anyway. <laughs> so going back up to verse 4 now, I won't take as long in verse 4 as I did last week. It was very precious last week, and if you weren't here, you get to listen to the CD and find out why I said that. And all I'm going to say now is how wonderful it is that all these things that are done away with, no longer any death, mourning, crying, or pain. And remember from the way that the, the original language wrote it, what God is saying is not just the doing away of those things, but he's wiping out everything that brings the tears to the eyes of the God forever and ever <coughs> and ever. Do you know how important that is? Would you ever want this to come back? No. no. Remember what happens at the end of millennium? We've got the Lord ruling and reigning. You've got yeah, we'll peace on the face of the earth. But you know in man's heart, many of them, so many we can't number them, there was rebellion still. Mm -hmm. And when they were given a chance, they showed that their heart was not with our Lord, mm -hmm. with our God. Amazing. And they go after it. That will never happen again. 
nothing ever will mar this forever. Oh, hallelujah. I never have a worry. Never have to think it'll repeat. You know, we're taught history repeats itself. We're taught, especially in the Jewish mind, that's why we bring out the Holocaust still. People will say to me, why do you bring up the Holocaust? That's done. It's gone. It's past. Because if we don't bring it up, it'll happen again. We have to learn. We have to remember. All of that is how we are affected in this world. Notice the word affected. Maybe I could even say that's how we're infected, because it is. That will never happen. We never have to worry that something is going to change the scene. No. Is this too good to be true? No. This is the happily ever after, and it is not a fairy tale. This is God's word. It is true. This is our future. So when you're discouraged now, day after day, and it feels like forever, thank God it's not forever. Thank God this is just a drop in the bucket. It would be, it would be like taking a whole all of our oceans, and 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 that could be one drop in the bucket of eternity. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> let your minds go. Just let them go. So the former things are passed away. It's an eternal scene. All things are new. I think we are ready now. I think I've caught us up to where I thought we were. And uh, we will look at verse 5 then. So we'll go back up to the top. And we see, because we want to know what it's going to be like. We're hearing what's not going to be there. Let's see what is there. Verse 5 says, Then the one sitting on the throne said, Let me see if I want He who sits on the throne said, Behold, are you awake? Are you paying attention? I am making all things new. You get the idea he wants us to know it's new? Don't you love new? It's fresh, it's exciting, it's not marred. You, you get something new? Pam said she's got a new car. Are you trying to keep it shiny clean new right now? <laughs> Still the Still the newness works off. Guess what? In the new... Eternity, the new heavens and the new earth, it never wears off. Yes. <laughs> no, he will not be clean. <laughs> and he said, when he was speaking, he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. I get the idea. I can just I can just hear y'all yo yo John going, Really? Really? And the Lord saying, Yes, really? Yes, really? <laughs> and then trying to wrap his mind around it. I mean, by this point, that poor guy had to have just, I mean, his mind has been stretched far beyond human capacity to see all he's seen to record and to tell and to give it to us. And now he's seeing the new. He's seeing into that eternal future. Because remember, he's not just being told. He's seeing. God's given him eyes to be able to see, whether he's been caught up in the spirit or whether it's in a vision, doesn't matter. Either which way, he is seeing the reality of the real. He's not imagining. It wasn't, write it down, and, and you know, you can watch a science fiction movie, you can watch Disney, and you'll say, oh, it can only happen on TV. This is beyond that, and it's not, it's not, it's not fake, it's not unreal. And that's what I think the Lord is trying to get across to us, because I hear People say, if you hear something that sounds too good to be true, it is. How many times have you been taught that? I was taught that from the time I was little. If it sounds too good to be true, it is. Put your guard up. Be careful. Well, guess what? Let every guard down. Jump in the pool. The water is fine. Dip yourself all the way in. Let it go over your head. Let it blow your mind. Relish in it. This is what God wanted all along. He wanted you in an intimate relationship with him, in his presence, dwelling with him, tabernacling with him, where it is perfect. Wow. So it's not too good to be true when God says it. And it's a new thing. He's making all things new. He is faithful. He is true. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but through me. When you are in him, you are in the truth. The truth is in you. This is your future. And I think he's reassuring Yohanan every way he can. And in turn, knowing that was going to need to come all the way down. Especially the closer we get to the tribulation. Because the more this world gets evil, 
the more I want that glory, the more I want out of this. I don't want to hear the horrors. I don't want to turn on the news at night and hear the, the latest murder and mayhem. I want to get, I want to catapult right over and into. And guess what? One day, soon, very soon, we will find ourselves. And you all can come up to me in the new heavens yeah, in our new home and yes. say, Rochelle, remember when? Remember when we tried to think what it looked like by a little funny object glass? <laughs> and we'll laugh at how it didn't compare to the glories that God has prepared for those who love him. Do you love him? Yes. Then he's prepared it for you. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> Fine with me. <laughs> then he said to me, verse 6, that I did everything, all things new, eternity is the new beginning. If this is new in character as well as recently made. So he recently made this heavens and this earth, this new heavens and the earth, the new earth that he's talking about, but then this character is new and fresh and exciting, and it's not tainted by sin. You know, as glorious as this creation is, this creation is tainted by sin. We don't see any one thing perfect here, and yet we see glory upon glory that just blows my mind about our God. But it's, hang on, hang on. Don't need a seatbelt, though. Fly. <laughs> Verse 6. It's in here somewhere. There it is. <laughs> then he said to me, it is done. done. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. Jam pack. He put so much in every verse. Let's go back and take it phrase by phrase because I want us to get the every part. So first of all, it is done. What's done? What's done is everything that we've been talking about to bring us to this point. All the testing for man, it's done. We're never going to be tested again to see if our hearts are right before God, if we're going to stay faithful, if we're going to be conformed to his image. It's all done. It's all over. It is finished. I love that. There are days I think we all have experienced when we're just plain weary. And yet God says, don't be weary in well-doing, for in due time you will reap if you faint not. He promises, he encourages us that in the new eternity, we don't have to keep ourselves up. We don't have to put on the armor of God. We don't have to push and the pull and the hope, and we don't have to get discouraged when we see ourselves not make it because it's all past. It's all over. done. The battle is over. over. The race has been run. I didn't think about it, but I put up here today, obstacles are those frightful things you see when you take your <coughs> eyes off the goal. What's the goal? The Jesus. author and finisher yes. of our race. Yes. Yes. Looking at the Lord, and when you look in his face, we know we do well. So when we look around that we get in trouble. But here he is telling us it is done. Time is ended. <laughs> Hallelujah. You will never hear me say I'm fighting that stupid clock again. <laughs> there are no clocks in the new eternity. I guarantee you. Time is over. It is so confining. It is so binding. It is so frustrating. And yet also it is a blessing. As we know time moves on. We know that we're coming to this point. But this is where when eternity begins, time ends. Time is what human deals with. Human is bound in time and space. Remember, before Yeshua came, Jesus, before he came to this earth, he was not bound. He had to choose to slip into a time. He had to choose to slip into a space. He had to put on the garment of humanity. Until then, his fullness was unbound. I can't think of another way to put it. This is what's done and over with. Nothing confining, nothing binding. The hearing the words, it is done, echoes in my ear. You know where it takes me? It's to the cross. It is finished. To the last time. It was over. The work was completed. The results continue on for eternity. Remember the arrow that never stops that eternity? Here we are. We're into that. I can take that arrow. The cross is right here. I can put a dot right there. I can put my, uh, my mathematical arrow, and I can shoot right here and do the, which lets you know it keeps going right over here. I can do it all the way over there. That's what we're seeing. It is completed. It is finished. In the same way, the Lord has never had to come back and do another thing for mankind. It was done. 
that's the same way for this future, what we're being told. All of this is done. It is over. Remember, he's wiped out everything that puts the tears in our eyes. We have the great work finished in relation to human affairs. It is complete. The redeemed, we're gathered in. We're home. You go away, what's the best part about going away? Coming home. <laughs> we're finally going to be home. It is not for vacation. We're home. It's over, it's done, it's completed. The redeemed are gathered in. The wicked are cut off. They're not even part of this where they can trouble us. It's gone, it's past for us. The truth is triumphant. Everything is complete. Everything. We are prepared for that eternal state that we can't even understand right now. So if you see me struggling, if you feel like I'm lingering here, it's because I keep saying in my spirit, Lord, these words fall short. Help me. Help me. Help me get across the greater that I know I'm leaving out there. And I hear the Lord say, it's okay, Michelle. They can't get it anymore, and you can't either. You can't get it across. Just let them trust me in it, too, and know this is what it is for I like us. Song, I, can only I can only imagine. That's a good one. And I love it. And yes, I can only imagine. And I think we're going to be doing a little everything. We're going to fall on our faces in, in that adoration and that awe. And then we're going to jump up and down. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And then boom, I'm down on my face again. And I think you'll all be able to do that. I can't wait till we can get to that point. Um, Alpha and Omega, that's in the Greek, the first letter and the last, like A to Z in our English, all up to top in our Hebrew. That's what it's saying. And here again, when we get to Genesis, fair sheet, and I think we're going there, well, we'll have a little interruption because we're going to do Jewish evangelism first, but then I think we'll go there. You're going to, I'm going to say, remember that day in our ending of our revelation? It took us all the way back to the beginning because the fourth word in the Hebrew, you've heard me teach on the first three if you've been with me, but the fourth word refers to the Aleph and the top in the creation of God, of who God is. It's fascinating. But do you see what's happening? Do you see the tie together? It all starts in Genesis, Bereshit, and it all is tied up in Revelation. <coughs> David McGee, great Bible teacher, said, it's like you're standing at Grand Central Station. In Genesis, you see all the trains go out. They're all going out. Every train you can think of, every doctrine, every belief, every th true beliefs, I mean, you know, everything that we're studying, all is going out. When you get to Revelation and you get to this point, it's like they've all come back home. Every train's come back home. Everything's been finished. Everything's been completed. And we get launched into this whatever. <laughs> whatever. What does God have for us? We will find out together. Yeshaya Isaiah 62, 7 says, And give him no rest until he <laughs> establishes and makes Jerusalem, Jerusalem a praise in the earth. When will Jerusalem be a praise in the earth? I believe that's in the new earth. And it's a Jerusalem that's praising her God in a new way. So even though some will say that's millennial, and I can see the shadow of it the millennial, I think the fullness of the fulfillment of that verse is taking place now in Revelation 21. I don't think it stops short before that. I believe that it is speaking of our Messiah because it's our Messiah who makes Jerusalem a praise because he inhabits, he's in the throne of Yerushalayim. That takes us back to Revelation chapter 1. Any of you remember that? How many of you are with me? <laughs> Do you know that's almost four years ago? <coughs> so congratulations to all of us when we started. We started in the fall of 2015 and we are in summer of 2019. Go all the way back to chapter 1 real quick. I don't think any of us remember it in the detail. But in chapter 1 gives us a description of Yeshua Jesus. It gives us a description of Elohim, God the Father, Jehovah. Ask me which is which. I don't know. Because as soon as I tell you, oh, this verse is talking about Yeshua the Son, I'll say, oh, no, wait a minute. But that's the name given to the Father in another place in Scripture. And then across again. So remember the express image? <laughs> this is more than a mirror copy. You know, mere copy is almost perfect. We can almost get an idea, but it falls short, even if it's not perfect. Okay? Revelation 1, we're going to look real quickly, verses 5 through 8. 
and from Yeshua the Messiah, the faithful witness. Hmm. What word did we just read in chapter uh, verse six? These words are faithful and true. So, who is faithful? Yeshua the Messiah, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the first to rise in in resurrection resurrection body, and the ruler of the earth's kings, King of kings, Lord of lords, glory, hallelujah. He is the top. To him, the one who loves us, who has freed us from our sins at the cost of his blood. And what are we reading about? The freedom from every effect of sin. Do you see Revelation 1 being echoed in 21? What an author. What an author. Who has caused us to be a kingdom? So that a uh, kingdom that is Kohanim, priests for God, his father, to him be the glory and the rulership. How long? Forever. And ever. ever. Forever and ever and ever and ever. Do I sound like a broken record? Good, because I'm going to keep doing it until I do. <laughs> forever and ever and ever and ever. And I haven't even begun. I haven't even begun. And then we get the amen on it. And then, yes, behold. He is coming with the clouds. Now, I was asked at the beginning, and I think it might even be on our tape, what, what's the word Shekhinah? S-H-E-E, I'll put it in the, the closest we can get in our, uh, uh, okay, I'll put an E in there. That'll help, okay? Some say Shekhinah, but the Hebrew is closer to Shekhinah, and when you see it like this, and I'm not sure if it's an I or an E, you might see it spelled a little different on the end. There are many variations because remember, Hebrew doesn't have vowels. So when you try to get from Hebrew into English and English back into Hebrew, you, you have to make some adjustments. That's why they say there's 113 ways to spell Hanukkah. I haven't counted them all myself. They're never really hard. <laughs> so when it says here that it's talking about the, this glory, the Shekhinah glory is coming with the clouds. The Shekhinah glory was enveloped in cloud. That's how they saw the Shekhinah glory of God. Remember, the glory of God is so bright that human eyes cannot look at it. Even when Moshe wanted to see, God showed him what was left behind. Like when you look at a light, you turn off that light and you see the afterglow. That's the idea from the Hebrew. That's all Moshe saw, just what was left behind. And that was enough to set his face aglow for, we don't even know how long. It was enough that that, that was all he could contain. And that wasn't even the full essence of the, the glory of our God. So when it's saying here that he's coming with clouds, he could be coming in that Shekhinah glory, then also we know that the clouds can be with others because we know the cloud of witnesses from Hebrews 12 too is people. But we saw much more as we studied clouds recently, and I, sometime I will bring you the teaching on it because I'm just now into another level of depth in the Hebrew with it. It also brings into the idea of tabernacling the idea of that unity, because when Moshe went up into the mountain and the, the cloud enveloped, and I'm talking about back up Mount Sinai when he got the commandments from God, it talks about Moshe being in the cloud for seven days. For six days, we don't even know what happened. The seventh day, God gave him. What happened during that time? An intimate just being in each other's presence. I don't know whether God spoke. If he did, we don't have it recorded. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't, because you know, you can just be in somebody's presence. And sometimes that's overwhelmingly enough. And other times, yes, there's the little things shared between two. We'll ask Moshe one day. <laughs> but that's all in Shekinah, that's all in the glory cloud, that's all there in that. So when it's referring here to his coming, now we know that, that there's clouds in heaven, but I don't believe it's talking about our white fluffy clouds. I believe he's coming with the cloud of witnesses. He's coming with the angels who comes with him, but he's also coming in all of his glory. Because remember, if we didn't have revelation, we would never have recorded his return in glory. We would only have it talking about it coming, but we wouldn't have the view. We have the first coming where he did not come in the Shekinah glory, where he came humble, low. He was wrapped in swaddling clothes. He was laid in an animal trough. He was born in a stable where animals are born. Why? 
amazing is the Lamb of God. And where are little lambs born? In the stable. He came for the purpose of taking care of the sin issue. He didn't come with all the glory. Yes, that was a king born in a stable. But when the kings of the east came to visit him, they went to the palace, but he wasn't there, was he? Because he didn't come as king. But here he comes as king. Comes in all that glory. So yes, this can speak to the Shekinah glory also. And every eye will see him. That's why we know this is not our rapture verses. Not every eye will see. Only those who know him will see him in rapture. Otherwise, when it says every eye will see, we know it's talking about his second coming all the way down to earth. And those who will see him include those who pierced him. Who pierced him? Zechariah, Zechariah 12, 10 tells us that when God pours out his spirit on the inhabitants, that then Israel will see the one whom they had pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for their only son. And when was God pierced? All we have to know is in the cross in Yeshua. <laughs> Israel was the nation that he came to, not just to save Israel, but for them to take the message to the rest of the world. Is this blaming Israel and Israel only? Of course not. Remember, the Lord willingly laid down his life. No man could take it from him. He could have jumped off that cross at any moment in time he wanted. He could have slain the people who were who were nailing him to the cross. But he willingly laid down his life for the salvation of all mankind. But he doesn't come back humble, lowly, riding on a donkey. No, he comes back king of kings, lord of lords, in glory, in splendor, wearing his white robe, the crowns on his head, the sword out of his mouth, annihilating every enemy that's still in front of him. Gone and dead. Conquering king. Good way to put it. Conquering king. Hallelujah. And all the tribes of the land. Hmm. Now, if anybody in here is Native American, don't take this the wrong way. But is that what he's talking about? No. no. The tribes of the land, that's Israel. Because remember, he was Israel's Messiah. So he's making it very clear that the tribes... Israel, the nation, is really going to see him and to know him. And again, it says they will mourn him. The same way I read to you from Zechariah, or I quoted Zechariah 12, 10. Mourning, because they'll realize, oh, you were our Messiah. We missed it. And in that moment, they have faith to believe. Those who are seeing that and are believing at that very moment are the ones that we see have that saving faith where it, uh, Shaul Paul says, then all Israel will be saved. He's talking about those. That nation then will be in right fellowship with his God. <clears throat> yes, and amen, and then here we go. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the Olive and the Top. I am the A and the Z. Whatever translation you're reading, it says, Adonai, God of the heavens armies, the one who is, who was, and who is coming. And here we go, right back to Revelation 21. Do you not hear it? Do you not see how the two relate? Because here he is, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the start and the finish, the completer. It is all there. Hallelujah. Every eye got it, every T cross. In our Hebrew, we say every jot and tittle, which the Lord said would heaven and earth would not pass away till everything was fulfilled. Everything was, heaven and earth passed away. Here comes the new, and it is glorious. And I'm not even doing it one bit of justice, <laughs> no matter how hard I try. So we see it speaking of the Messiah. We see that from 21.6, the Alpha and Omega is the Messiah. He's the beginning and the end. He's the one who was pierced that we saw in Revelation 5. He's the one coming back, I'm sorry, Revelation 1, verses 5 through 8. The one who is coming in the clouds, the one who is every eye will see him. He is the one who will be the ruler forever and ever. That's all that we're seeing. Between these verses, you've got the whole book of Revelation, but here it is in, in living glory. Now, that son that we are seeing, S-O-N, capital S-O-N, the son of God, the Messiah, we also are reminded he is sharing the throne with the Father. We're going to see that, especially when we get into chapter 22, but we're going to take a sneak peek, because you know me. I always cheat. I read the end of the book. I don't have any problem with that. So go with me, Revelation 22, real quick. I think for you is probably just turning a page. 
And just, I'm going to read the, the first three verses so you get a whole picture. I'm not going to talk about every phrase until we get to chapter 22. We're on 21 right now. So 22 says, Next the angel showed me the river of the water of life, sparkling like crystal, flowing from, and here you go, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Between the main street and the river was the tree of life, producing 12 kinds of fruit, a different kind every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing for, were for healing the nations. No longer will there be any curses. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city. What city? The New Jerusalem. When we've just read about in chapter 21, because remember when, when Yohanan wrote this, he didn't stop and say, okay, chapter 22. He just kept writing. So he's just given him the description, and we're going to get that description of the new city, and now he tells us that in that city is the throne of God and the throne of the Lamb, and his servants will worship him. Who are his servants who are worshiping him? Us. 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 We got a few others with this too, but that's us. Okay, we'll go back to that when we get to chapter 22 again, but put on your notes and choose people. <laughs> go back to 21 though with me. We're going back to verse 6 still, but what I want you to see is the son is sharing the phone, the phone the throne with his father, okay? It is, I like to call it a dual seat, a love seat. But it's a throne built for two. And it's God the Father and God the Son. Let me give you another witness, because do we take things out of the mouth of one witness? We look to make sure that we're staying united, and we look for other. So go with me now to 1 Corinthians. Shaul Paul is the author writing to the people in Corinth. And we're going to see in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to look at verses 24 through 28. Let's see if he can be a backup witness for Yochanan. Did Shaul Paul and Yochanan know each other? I don't think so. At least not in the beginning we know they didn't because Yochanan, John, was with the Lord and we know Shaul Paul comes into the scene after the Lord's already come back into heaven. So at least initially, no, no contact. But my point in that, two different people, two different backgrounds, two different times. Let's see if they agree with each other. If you have two people see something happen in the same room, sometimes it's hard to get them to agree on what they just saw. If I had somebody run through here all of a sudden, snatch something and be gone, I would ask you, okay, who saw what? Do you know in a typical room, they'll tell you that they were blonde, they were brown, <laughs> they were short, they were fat, they were tall, they were skinny. I mean, you get so much, it's a riot. It's the same way playing that gossip game. You start, you know, you whisper into the air. By the time it gets over to the other side of the room, it's nothing like what started up. <laughs> so when God is the author, there's one author writing it. He's working through different people. But then it's all in agreement. First Corinthians 15, 24. 1524. And you know what? I'm going to go in this one because I think this might be language a little better for you to understand. So where I thought I was there, give me just a moment, please. And I should be able to get to it faster than this one, I think. First Corinthians chapter 15, starting with verse whoop, verse 24. Okay. And then comes the end. Okay? We know we're talking about the end times. When he hands over the kingdom to to the God and the Father, okay? Who could be handing over the kingdom to God, the Father? Yeshua, Jesus. Jesus. We know, it could be no one else. So we know this is who it's talking about. And in fact, the, the last of verse 23 says, those who are Messiahs or Christ that is coming. So we know what it's talking about. Then comes the end. When he hands over the kingdom to God, the Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Lord is reigning now, but all enemies are not under the Lord's feet yet. We know that in essence, they're paid for. It's death, but we still have death, don't we? We still have the enemy of the Lord around and doing work. So the Lord is still waiting for God the Father to say, I've put all the enemies under your feet. And the last enemy under his feet, we're told, is death. There will never be death again at that point. Oh, and it even says it here, verse 26, the last enemy that will be abolished is death. Verse 27, for he has put all things in subjection under his feet. 
God's put everything in subjection under the feet of the Messiah. That when he says, or actually it's the Lord doing the work. I'm sorry, because the Lord's the one who came and did the work here on this earth. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he's accepted who has put all things in subjection to him. That's hard to understand. But what he's trying to say is the one who is making everything subject is above it. That everything is the, under him. He's the exception. He is not subjected underneath. Okay? He is above it. But then what does he say? When all things are subjected to him, to God the Father, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him. So in essence, what I see is the Lord giving it to the Father and the Father giving it to the Son. And the two are again equal in it. The same way we see God the Father and God the Son involved in creation equally, that they both were the creators. We see scripture that shows us God created. We see scripture that shows us Yeshua, Jesus created in that same way, I see the same thing. That in essence, even though the Lord is saying in his, it would have to be the human side of him that could subject himself under God the Father. At the same time, God the Father has lifted him up back under that throne. It's an equal throne. So you don't have this. It's not God the Father and God the Son. It's God the Father and God the Son. Remember, they are triunity, God the Holy Spirit being the third part, all equal. That's why no matter what example I bring to you, it falls short. I tell you, it's like an egg that has three parts, the shell, the yolk, and the white. But are those three parts equal? No. They're totally different. Okay? So that's where it falls apart. Some will say is, yes, water, ice, and uh, steam. steam. Thank you. Is steam equal to the water? Is water equal to the ice? No. So again, that is a three different ways to see one. Yes. So as close as we can get. Roger, we're beginning to freeze everybody. Don't try them, but we <laughs> have a little place. The same way that we try, we just take on faith. This God who is so great, he could not be contained in our minds. He could not be contained in one. We see his personification, who he is, in his names, in his attributes, in his actions. We see it in the Father, we see it in the Son, and we see it in the Spirit. But we know the three are what? So this is what it is being said here. They share the throne equally together. It is not a superior and an inferior. It's an equality. Because even though God the Son took on that human form, he never was not God the Son at the same time. So again, do we understand it? Yes. <laughs> we accept it, but yes. I don't think we understand it. <laughs> this much as you know. This much as you know. So the Messiah returns the throne to the Father. He, the Lamb, shares the eternal throne with the Father. And now we go back to Revelation 21. We see what else he's telling us in verse 6 still. The last phrase of verse 6, Revelation 21 and verse 6, because he's offering something. He's The way they said it's done, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, which is God the Father, which is God the Son, I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. Okay, he's, or you might have from a fountain. Did I use the word fountain? What are the... One of the references, yes. oh, I have spring of water, you may have a fountain, yes. okay? Oh, yes. The idea is the spring springs up and it's like a fountain, you know, that's continually, that's the idea. This is a fountain that's a spring of water. The spring is the source. So the Lord himself is the source of this water that is, is just gushing. It's free. And he's saying, take it, take it. The one who's thirsty, um, he's giving the, the spring of the water of life without cost. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Because you know what? I'm broke. I don't care what I've got. I'm broke. If gold is asphalt, <laughs> I'm broke. There's nothing I could do to buy it. I can't earn it. I can't buy it. And I couldn't even keep it. But the Lord's given it for you. Without cost. He says he gives it. Now, the fountain, again, speaking of abundant life that springs up and continues, it goes on and on and on. Can you picture it in your mind? Can you just see it going and going and going and going? And when you are thirsty, what's the only thing that quenches your thirst? Water. water. There is nothing else. I don't care what man's made or what man does that water. It's just water right from the throne of God. 
It's also referring to his abundant character. It's referring to eternal life because, again, it's an eternity. The blessings are flowing. Water refreshes. Water satisfies. Water cleanses. And water even <coughs> heals. Everything we need is in this water. And he tells us, come drink. Drink as much as you want. Drink till you're satisfied and turn around and drink again. It never ends and it never costs. Let's look at water just real quickly, real short. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah 55. And we are going to verse 1. Isaiah 55, 1. Hmm, Isaiah. Did you and y'all come on and get together? <laughs> oh, no, wait a minute. Isaiah, you lived in 700 plus B.C., and Yochanan, you lived in the first century A.D. So there's about 800 years between you two guys. How come you sound like Yochanan? Because chapter 55, verse 1 says, All you who are thirsty, come to the water. You without money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money. It's free. Why spend money for what isn't food? Your wages for what doesn't satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and you will eat well. You will enjoy the fat of the land. Open your ears and come to me. Listen well, and you will live. I will make an everlasting, everlasting covenant with you. The grace I assure shall be your father. Isn't that exciting? Does that not sound the same? We're hearing the same words, are we not? Again, out of now the two three witnesses, let it be established. It is free. It is, and when it says come by, it makes it clear. Without money, come and buy. So in essence, you just come and say, I want to buy some Lord. He says, fine, how about it? You ever played store with a little child? You didn't all play money and it's not real, and that child thinks they're buying everything. Well, that's what it is. And had I remembered, I would have brought you a great little story. If I remember and I can lay my hands on it, um, Roger or Patty, whoever wants to Google, can try. See if you can find, um, I think it's called When Faith Goes to Market. But the idea behind it is when you go to the market of God, take the basket with you. And you take everything you need. And it's free. It's free. You don't have to check out. It's free. It's a cool little thing. If you can find it, great. If you can't, no problem. I'll bring it next week as long as I can find it. You buy okay. The truth and don't sell it. You buy the truth and don't sell it. You can't sell it. It's priceless. Okay, so we've seen it out of Yeshua. Let's go to John, to one of his first books, Yohanan. We're going to, we have to get away from the little books and from Revelation. We're going to his, his time with Yeshua. Uh, the Gospel of John is what I'm trying to say, chapter 4. Verses 10 through 14. And it's going to be Yeshua himself talking. So even though it's Yohanan's book, we're getting a direct quotation of what Yeshua said. Now, I don't know about you, but that's authority enough for me right there if Yeshua says it. That, that sells it there. We even have more than, than that. Chapter 4, verse 10. Yeshua answered her. This is the woman at the well. We're jumping into a story I think you're probably familiar with, but I'm reading it to you from the complete Jewish Bible. It's just a little different flavor so you have to think because we get too used to hearing it and we don't hear it anymore so I love to shake it up <laughs> if you knew God's gift Yeshua speaking to this woman if you knew God's gift that is who it was saying to you give me a drink of water then you would have asked him and he would have given you living water what just happened the this, this Samaritan woman had come to the well in the middle of the day when the women wouldn't be there because she is not she's persona non grata Okay? She's not living a life that the women want her around, that she wants to be around them. So she's coming to get her water needs at a time when it's not a popular time. She finds a Jewish man. Because remember, Yeshua, Jesus was Jewish. She finds a Jewish man sitting at the well. He's waiting to get a cup of water out of that well. Now he's waiting at a time when it's not normally going to be opened and water is going to come out. But he knew he had a divine appointment, did he not? Amen. And he asked her to give him water. You, a Jew, you're asking for me, a dirty Samaritan? <laughs> well, instead of him dealing with that issue and answering her on that issue, he just cuts through all the right tape. I love it. He just lays it on one. He says, hey, if you knew who you were talking to, you would have asked me to give you this living water. And what will this living water do? Well, let's keep reading. She said to him, sir, get out of the bucket. The well is deep. Where do you get this living water? It's just 
You got it. Good. Thanks. I'll, I'll get it in just a moment, okay? She's, she's saying, why would I ask him for water? Well, how are you going to get it for me? You got no bucket to put down in the well. It's way down there. How are you going to bring it up? What are you going to hold it? How can you give it to me? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Verse 12. You aren't greater than our father Yaakov, are you? Jacob. You know where she was? She was at Jacob's well. I'm drunk from Jacob's well. It is deep. I remember when they dropped the stone. It was a long time before you finally heard the kerplunk. And when they brought the bucket up for us to drink out, it was a long time pulling that up. But you know what? It's the best water I've ever tasted on this earth. Uh, no prejudice. Just because it's my great, 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 some mom back there, granddaddy. No prejudice. Just because I'm Rachel and he's Yahoo. For those of you who don't get that, never mind. <laughs> Are you greater than our father Jacob who dug this well? He gave us as well, and he drank from it, and so did his sons, so did his cattle. This is where Yaakov was watering his flocks. This is where he drank, and it's come all the way down to her time to, in that day. And, of course, we're 2,000 years past that, but she's, she's still trying to figure this all out. She's got her mind on all the earthly, does she not? And Yeshua answers her, everyone who drinks of this water, We'll get thirsty again. You know what? I've drunk a lot of water since I drank Jacob's. <laughs> I a lot of water. But whoever drinks the water I will give him will never be thirsty again. On the contrary, the water I give him, hello, will be him a spring of water inside him, welling up into eternal life. You see the connection? What a picture he drew for her. He's talking about the living water that we just read about in Revelation. And who actually is the living water? The Holy Spirit. Jesus. The Holy Spirit. Or Jesus himself. Yes. Because yeah. yes, they're one and the same again. Yeah. Spring up, filling, refreshing, satisfying, cleansing. <coughs> we read that the, 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 uh, with the washing of the water and the word that we are renewed, we are made new. It's beautiful, is it not? That's what we are seeing here. And he's telling everybody, just drink. And then to show perfectly that it's Yeshua Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to say and because it's both, just go to chapter 7, verses 37 and 38, I do not have time, it would take more than even what's left in class here to tell you the whole Jewish ceremony that's taking place at this time and all the, the meaning behind it, but sometime remind me when we have a chance to do other topics, I'll give you on the water, it is fascinating. But John chapter 7, verse 37 says, On the last day of the festival, Hoshana Rabbah, on that festival, the Jewish festival, when they're dealing with the water, okay? And that's why he's drawing it. The same way when I believe that he said, I'm the light of the world, he pointed to the menorah. I believe at this time when they were dealing with the water. And again, it's a whole, it's a libation ceremony. I could take a whole hour, hour and a half just to tell you all behind it. But he took what they were doing. And he showed how it's a picture of him. So and he what? said, John 7, 37 and 38. Oh, okay. Just John. Just yes. little John. You were just a couple pages over from the Samaritan yes. woman. Okay? <laughs> and anyone, and he cries out. Okay? On the last day of the festival, of Shana Rabbah, Yeshua stood and cried out, If anyone is thirsty, let him keep coming to me and drinking. Whoever puts his trust in me, as the scriptures say, here we go, Rivers of living water will flow from his inmost being. Now he said this about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, whom those who trusted in him were to receive later. The Spirit had not yet been given because Yeshua had not yet been glorified. Yeshua had to go back up into heaven. He told him, if I don't go back up into heaven, the Spirit won't come. But you want the Spirit to come. The Spirit will be even better for you than I am for you. How can that be, Lord? Yeah. Well, guess what? Because the Lord chose to confine himself in that human form, he was in one place at one time during his earthly life. The Spirit has not taken on that form that confines. He is free to be right now in what? About 25, 30 hearts right here. Free Hallelujah. to flow and to work, to give us that living water that's splashing up. Yeah. You're feeling right now that's just flooding all over you. You know when it's 110 out and you get in that refreshing water, how good it feels? That's how I picture it. You see the little ones that play with the water just bubbling up? That's how I picture it. He's just sprinkling us with that fresh water, Hallelujah. renewing and refreshing. And if you're thirsty, drink. 
Yeah. Drink long, take all you want. Do you worry about it running out? No. No, no. no stick your cap in, get full, drink it, and look, where did it come from? Can you see a hole? Can, is it any less? Can we all drink at once? Yes. yes. That's the beauty. The Spirit is not only in each one of us, but He brings us all in unity so that here together in this class, we are one in the Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Springs of living water. Yeah. Refreshing, cleansing, satisfying, and healing anything you have need of even right now. Wow. This is the God of Revelation that we are seeing all the way through Scripture. I could take you all the way back to the water that came out of the rock. That water, that was no little rock, people. <laughs> that was no little rock. That had to give water for two and a half million people and their animals. That was a gush. That was huge. And that was a picture of who we're seeing here today. All the way through. I love how scripture brings it through. Remember, it's one story. It's from beginning to end, from Bereshit to Revelation, it is one story. It is his story. It is his story. It's his story through time. In relation to Israel, because that's how God chose to bring it to the nations. Wow. What a mind God has. What a plan God has. Uh, no words. No words. They're gone. They're gone. We'll go back to Revelation. We'll go to chapter 21 again. We'll go to verse um, 7. But keep in mind, too, without cost. Without cost. Without cost. This isn't for the high and mighty in the palaces. This isn't for those who've been real good and put in their 40 hours of work and bring home the paycheck. This is for those who have nothing to give to it, nothing to offer the Lord. He just freely gives. He is a great equalizer because whether you're rich or poor, whether you're famous or unknown, whether you're living in a hovel, living in a palace, whether you have a great job, whether you're in need of a job, whether you're male, whether you're female, whether you're Jew, whether you're Gentile, it's all the same or whosoever. If you would have asked me, I would have given you water, and you would have never thirst again. Oh, give it to me, Lord. Give it to me. Give it to me right now. She said, not knowing what she was saying. But look at what happened. Because it so changed her life that she went out and she told others. Well, let it so change your life. Go out that door and share it with others. Offer a cold drink. Hardly ever will you be turned down. Okay, verse 7. Revelation 21 and verse 7. He who overcomes will inherit these things. Well, everything we've been talking about, all of this eternity, all that that's for us, even the, the water of life, everything. We inherit everything, all these things. I will be his God, and he will be my son. Okay, who is the overcomer? I want to be the overcomer. I want, I want, believe me, I want, I'll be... I don't even have to say first in line because there's no line. <laughs> but I want it. Who is the overcomer? Do you remember the verse I've given verse, you? The one who got lies. Yeah. 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 Okay, a little different than the one I'm after. You're close. You're close. Yours is probably good too. But I gave you a long time ago, I think in Revelation 1. <laughs> I gave you Jesus Christ. Okay, and you're all right. You're all right. Everything you're saying is right, but what I want is go to First Yohanan, First John chapter five. And I encourage you to memorize these verses. I think they're that important. That you know what I'm going to the version I'm more used to because I do know it and I will start it and then I'll be in trouble because I'll be saying it whoops with different words. Okay. First Yohanan. Same author. Okay? He's bringing it up to us clearly though. Chapter 5 and verses 4 and 5. Okay? If you want to understand somebody, and they've written several books, and they're talking about some of the same thing, you can use another one of their books to help you understand what they're saying. Because maybe they delved into it more fully here and less in this one. 
The same way like Shaul Paul, when he wrote to the Thessalonians, he wrote two times. The second time, he didn't spell everything out from the first. He built on it, okay? So here we go. We've got the same author here, and we're going to see and understand what he's meaning by this. Uh, first John, first John, on, chapter 5, verse 4. Whatever is for, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Right there. What overcomes? Our faith. So everything you said was right because it all was our faith. Verse 5. Who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Yeshua Jesus is the Son of God. That's it in a nutshell. That's your gospel in a nutshell. You have faith in God through his Son. You are an overcomer. What overcomes? Your faith. What does the faith overcome? Everything. The world. Anything that you say. What did you say? It overcomes evil, pain, suffering. It overcomes questions, doubt, everything. Our faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith comes from God. He is the one who puts it in us. And how did they how did they become a martyr? By their faith. By their faith. I often go to Rachel Scott because she's quick and easy and she's our time so we can really understand. She's a kid. She was about 16, just recently, in the last few months of her life, back right in fellowship with her God. And when she was asked, Do you believe in Jesus? with a gun in her face, and her word, yes, her faith overcame that gun. It overcame whatever moment of fear must have wanted to grab hold of her. But greater was he who was in her than he who was in the world. Don't worry about man who can take your life. Worry about the one who takes your soul. Where did her soul go? Immediately. In a split second, she was out of all. Didn't know pain, didn't know suffering, didn't even know death. In an instant, she was at her home forever with her Lord and Savior. That's an overcoming faith. That faith climbs every hurdle, every hill, every mountain. Your faith is your key. It overcomes everything. So when we read here in Revelation 21 and verse 7, and I've got to go back to it, hopefully you kept your finger there. But I have to go back to it. When we read, he who overcomes, then it's talking about those who have faith. And remember, how much faith do we need? And what size is a mustard seed? Tiny grain, like a grain of sand. Did he make a master of that much faith? Guess what? God gave you that much when he born you. Because he said he put in each a measure of of faith, that they could come to faith. You can't measure anything smaller. God gave you the faith. And then all you have to do is feed on it. Feed on it. Feed, on it. feed your faith and your doubts will starve to death. There you go. Oh. Yeah, another one for the board. <laughs> yeah, let's go up another week. <laughs> I think I put it up before, but that's up again. If you're trying to write it down real quickly, feed your faith and your doubts will starve to death. And that's a good starvation. <laughs> you want them to starve to death. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so we've got the faith that overcomes, uh, and we have he who overcomes will inherit all these things we were, we're talking about. I will be his God, and he will be my son. Now, obviously, that's talking relationship, and I want to make it very clear. Does that mean that we have to hold on? We have to work up our faith and we have to hold on so that we get it in the end? And if we have doubts in between, we lose it? No. Because remember, he gave us the faith to believe. It's that faith that is there. Even when our mind causes us to doubt, we still have our faith. Yes. It is still under that. We just need to lean on the faith and feed that faith and not feed our doubts. But it is not what we muster up and do because we couldn't. We couldn't even come to God. That he draws us. That's the faith to believe. And that faith is saving faith. That faith never fails. That faith, because it came from God, doesn't start and stop. That's a continual forever faith. So, no, I'm not telling you that you got to hang on. 
The same way you can take the picture and you can look at Noah when God put Noah in the ark. He didn't put him on the outside. Let's nail a big peg here. Hold on to this peg, Noah. Here comes the storm. Hold on. Hold on. If you hold on to the end, you'll be saved. No. No. He put him in the ark. Shut the door. Noah didn't shut the door. God shut the door. He proved that. He sustained him in there. He kept him safe. He kept him dry. He fed him. He clothed him. He gave him everything he needed. And then when he brought him out, he gifted him his bow. And his promise. God does it all. God does it all. All you have to do is receive it. The same way he says, come to the water, you have to receive it. You have to accept it. What's the cost? Free. Free gift of salvation for all who believe. Hallelujah. If it was dependent on me, I'd never make it, people. I'd never make it. And I'd live in constant fear of that one moment of slip being at the wrong time that God does not put us under that kind of condition. Who's the one speaking here? God's speaking here because he says, I will be his God and he will be my son. Remember when you're born again, you come into God's family. You're his child. God doesn't have any grandchildren. It didn't say, I'll be his grandfather. He'll be my grandchild. God only has first generation. Each individually has to come. But when they do come, then each one, and we can read into that for those of us who are female, daughters. Okay? He will be, I will be his daughter. Same thing. It's just the, the generic way of saying it. I think you all realize that. That is the state of the saved for eternity. For eternity. How long is eternity? So does it ever run out? Any worries? No. Any fears? No. Any doubts? No. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you. And let me show you what we're going to inherit because it says we inherit these things. Now, we've talked about some things, but that's not all we inherit. Do you know how rich you are? Go to Romans. Romans chapter 8 and verse 17. Let's find out how rich we are. Romans 8 and verse 17. Romans 8, 17 says, And if we are children, okay, I think I better read 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we're children of God. Okay, the Ruch Kodesh, the Holy Spirit within, lets us know. When you feel what you're feeling inside, when I'm speaking these words, that's the Spirit telling you, you're, you belong, you, you're one, you're in this, okay? So, when we are children of God, if we are children, verse 17, then we are also heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Messiah, with the Messiah, provided we are suffering with him in order also to be glorified with him. In other words, we do suffer for his namesake here. We are in that state, but the same way that we're, we suffer for him and with him in his, in his sufferings, we're going to be glorified with him in his glory also. So we are joint heirs with the Lord. Um, everything that is the Lord's is the ours if we're joint heirs. If you have a will and someone reads the will and the will says that, that everyone listed is a joint heir, they all get to share the bounty, don't they? So we're all joint heirs. What belongs to the Lord? Everything. Remember when we read a little earlier, God said, sit here at my right hand until I make all your enemies your footstool, till everything is yours. Who created this world? God and Jesus. So, whose is it? It's So, we're joint heirs, joint heirs with him for all of eternity. We're rich. We're rich. Look at Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. I'm getting a lot of my favorite verses today. I love this. Hebrews 1 and verse 2. I think, I think we can skip verse 1. If while you're getting there, I'll just read one. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers, how did he speak to them? He spoke to them by the prophets. He spoke in many ways, and he spoke, it says, in many portions, in many ways, in many scriptures, in many ways. God's constantly giving out the message. He brought it through prophets. He brought it through, um, who else can I think of? Prophets is all that's in my mind right now, but all kinds of ways. 
object lessons. He brought it, showing us the rock, showing us the water, many different ways he spoke, and he did this, okay? In the last days, he has spoken to us in his son. We all know who that son is. Whom he appointed heir of all things. By the way, Colossians 1.15 also tells us that, that he should have created it all, and that he's also heir of it all. So you can also go to Colossians 1, 15 to 17. That's not in your notes. It just popped in my mind. Um, so in these last days, he's spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. See, I should take you right from that to Colossians 1. In fact, you know what? Let's just jump and go. Okay? So you can see it in its fullness. Colossians 1. Colossians. And I'm probably going to want to go back to Ephesians. We'll see. I'm the Ephesians. <laughs> okay, my mind's spinning too fast. Back to um, Hebrews. In Colossians 1.15, while you're getting there, we're talking about Yeshua Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. When did we get to see God? When he put on skin, flesh, face. God chose to step into time and space. He put on a face. We call him Yeshua Jesus. Remember the matzah? The hidden matzah, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. One part comes out, the rest stays concealed. We see that one part we know is a picture of the triunity of God. And what part do we get to see? Yeshua Jesus. That's the part that comes out and is in view. And that's the part that then is taken, broken, buried, hidden, and resurrected all in our ceremony. We know who that's a picture of. I mean, even our, those who don't want to believe have a hard time arguing with that. So, he is the image. When he told um, Philip and the others, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Okay, here he's saying it again. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Does that mean that he was born like us and he was the first one ever born? Wait a minute, we know Adam was born before him. <laughs> First one in resurrection, yes, but this is talking position. The firstborn of all his creation in position, he has that headship position because he was the first resurrected, the first fruits of glory. The first resurrected fully. Now, no, no blood in him, flesh and bone, but he is alive because he's in that resurrected power, the power of God who resurrected him from the dead. Yes, firstborn of creation in position. He is the head of of all else. He was not created. Remember? Yeshua always existed. He didn't start at any point in time. There goes a number of your cults right there. Knock them out on their tail ends in that one sentence alone. Blast them out. Yes. Yes. Because it is blasphemy to say he is any less. And that's what the cults do. If you want to know whether it's a cult or not, ask them what they do with Yeshua Jesus. If he is not God, fully God himself, equal with God 100%, throw him out. Don't listen to him, don't associate, don't fellowship with him, and don't believe what they're saying. Because it's right against the word of God. Number so, one. Yes, Number yes. One. So here it's very clear. He is, he is the image of the invisible God. He's God with skin on. He wasn't created in time. It was that he's... The first, the head of all creation, is a position, it is a rank, it is a glorified, he's above it that we're seeing. For by him, all things were created. If he were created, how could all things be created by him? They'd have to say, after he was created, he created everything else. But remember when we go back to Bereshit, and I'm, I'm dying to give you Genesis 1 and 1 and all this detail that I have to wait. <laughs> but we see in that, the son created he was in the very act of creation right from the very beginning that we have given to us in Bereshit. We see that very clearly from the Hebrew. You cannot escape it time and time again in that one verse. And then when you get past the, the uh, Bereshit, Bara Elohim, in the beginning God created, which has the sun in there creating, then that fourth word, I'm giving it to you in that shell, but we'll hit it long and hard. That next word is made up of two Hebrew letters, the Aleph and the top, put together. It's not even written out what it means. It's skipped over. But in essence, what it's saying is the beginning and the end. The A to the Z, the Alpha and Omega, is the creator of our creation. God the Father and God the Son are beyond the creation. All of that is Amen. in the beginning God created. If I get high on God's words, excuse me. <laughs> okay. 
Back to nerd. He is. Where you keep up there, I love it. I love it too. I don't want to come down. <laughs> Thank you. I want to score. I want to just keep it. I want to take off. And maybe I've got to put stones in my pockets. No, don't. I want to go. <laughs> okay, so all things were created both in the heavens, on the earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. I don't think there's any, any area left uncovered. Nothing's left uncovered. He is before all things again, before it was all created, before it had in position a first of a rank that is above it all, then he is the firstborn from the dead. That doesn't mean that the, the little boy that Elijah raised from the dead wasn't raised from the dead. He is the firstborn in resurrected body. That little boy that Elijah raised from the dead died again. Others like that died again. Poor Lazarus. Four days out of this world. I can just hear the words he had with his sisters <laughs> after Yeshua left. You know, brought me back here. <laughs> yes. you know, hopefully he was sharing the glory so what he saw who had spoken with that. I can't imagine. I think God had done a special work in him to enable him to stay a little bit longer to serve the purposes of God. He was, he was special. He had a special um, job to do. Okay. Um, all things have been created through him and for him. He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. Remember we talked last week about the loosening, like the atom coming apart when the heavens and the earth were fled away. Here it's telling us he is the one that holds it all together. We know that even in our limited mind, we know. Even our science tells us that something is holding it together. The gravity, the, the centrifugal force, the, the way that it all comes together. It's not flying around. We're not dodging all of a sudden something coming out of the skies. And we, the earth doesn't suddenly yeah. tilt. And we got to get our balance again. And when we're on the side, because we're turning, we don't feel like we're sticking out sideways. Somebody's upside down right now. They don't feel upside down. All of this, we know, is amazing hand of our God. Who could have thunk it? Get your smartest person ever. Einstein or whoever you want to say, get him. And all he can do is begin to understand a little, a little of what God has put in order. And it was his finger work. It takes more faith to believe there's not a God than to believe there is. It really does. It takes more faith to believe in evolutionary process or anything else. To believe this all came together. Oh, yeah. Big bang, God said, bang, it happened. I believe that big bang. Roger's got a shirt that says that. That's not original with me. Okay, so we're in air of all things. We're inheriting all. We see that everything belongs to him, so it's going to belong to us. Can't you just hardly wait? Let's go skip out through the galaxies, okay? Want to go skip? Let's go look at the colors over here. Let's go see the designs over there. Let's go see what else God has created. And how many galaxies and beyond the galaxies? All for us to explore, to enjoy, to see. And remember my theory, too, about all these planets filling up with people praising God. And it'll take us all through eternity for the heavens to fill up because we can't measure the end of heaven. <laughs> Mind blower. Yes. Mind blower. Mind blower. Mind blower. But if God can do what he's done, I know I can believe in that. And then when I see God move in the split second timing in my life, and I see heads going already, we go around the room and share story after story after story. That amazes me. Because you know when he's doing that in your life, he's working in many other lives around you. The example of when I had to get to a certain point at a certain time that I would be going through a door when someone else that I did not know would be going through that door, or we would have had a major problem if I had had one more red light, one more car in my way, one less car in my way, if I had left a minute earlier, if I had left a minute later, all of these different things. So God's playing chess in my life, in the timing of my life, but in all those cars that I interacted with, and all those other things that happen. And we're talking about just one instant. And I can tell you story after story after story. What a God. What? A... <laughs> Give me words, Lord. <laughs> Give me words. I've got again. Back on. Okay. 
I told you it's going to be a good class. I hope it's blessing you like it's blessing me because I am not an A-high if you can't tell. <laughs> he is awesome. He is amazing. I'm looking for where I'm back and where I'm at. Maybe I've said it, that he holds all things together. And then he's our head. He's, oh, the first form from the dead. I thought what that means so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. He gets that preeminence and he deserves it. It was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made shalom peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Hallelujah. It's all in all. It's in his mastermind, in his plan, and it works out without ever an eraser, an oops, oi, facing, what am I going to do now? They did something I didn't expect. They took a left turn. I expected them to go right. GPS, rerouting. Rerouting. <laughs> That's not in God's vocabulary. <laughs> he now reroutes. And when he calls us his son, son or daughter, either way, when he calls us that, that is what kind of relationship? Personal. Okay, those are all good words, but I still know one more. Family? We're talking about the eternity, right? Okay. That is an eternal relationship. How many of you have given birth to a son? When does that son quit being your son? Never. Exactly. Exactly. But have you given birth to a son? But have you given birth to a daughter? Or you've never given birth at all? You are God's. And it's for. I don't care what you do. I don't care how bad, how good, you're still his kid. Now, do you want to go out to the witch shop? Yeah. <laughs> and be a good kid. I'm not giving you the freedom to do whatever. I'm not telling you to go out and be so well out. I'm just saying you're his, and he has the right to child train you then, too. Okay, let's get back to Revelation 21. I see that clock going. I thought we'd get through the whole chapter, but I, again, I trust you have been blessed as I have. My tablet has frozen. Okay, mm -hmm. we're going with the complete church one. I guess it was too much for my other one. <laughs> <laughs> Revelation 21, and I'm looking for a place that I can tie us up. I think we can do, let's do 7 and 8 real quick, because I don't think it'll take long. If it does, we'll find a place to stop. But we know what, what's been uh, told for us, and I love um, the complete church says, I myself will give water free of charge from the fountain of life. There's another way to put it, free of charge. We love hearing free, don't we? Mm -hmm. Free. Oh, everybody wants what's free. Verse 7, he who wins the victory will receive these things. That's where we've got the overcomer, right? i got to get back to the new American. Come on. It, there we go. There we go. Um, I love the Jewish for the Jewish flavor, but the New American um, stays real close to the Hebrew also, and some of the terminology there I think is more familiar for you also, so I want to bring it to you in that way. He who overcomes will inherit these things. We've said that. We've done all verse 7. Okay, verse 8. That for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part... Where is it? The lake of fire. Remember what was down here? That line that, that the race to go down to stand at the great white throne and they go cast in the lake of fire. That's what we're talking about. That does not end. When we have the new heavens and the new earth, remember, they were they stood before the great white throne after the heavens and earth were destroyed. They were judged as they're spanning in space. They were cast into the lake of fire. They are there forever. The same way when the beast and the false prophet went in a thousand years before Satan being cast in, he, as Satan's being cast in, they see the beast and the false prophet who are there. So we know that is eternity. That is where they are. That is their part. Um, all of them in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. But, and we talked long and hard about the second death, those that are part of the first resurrection. We see death once. We know that it came in three phases, three different times for the resurrection, but we know that we have no part in the second death. We are resurrected with the Lord. Second death was only for those who died unsaved, the lost. Yes, mm -hmm. the, the line at the bottom of your chart, the dark line, because it's representing sin, all people throughout all time who died 
apart from believing in the Lord. And it sealed their faith for all of eternity. No second chances anywhere. Okay, so the state of the unsaved for eternity, we have the cowardly, we have the fearful. Does that mean that if you're afraid, oh no, then you're not saved? No, it is not meaning that. But it is talking about um, we don't have the fear of hell because we have salvation. These who were who came back, oh, I can't believe in, in, in Christ because my family might disown me or because, you know, I, I just can't give control to someone else. I'm afraid to give control to someone else. These are the cowardly. They shrink back from the salvation that was freely given. They are cowardly. They were not willing to count the cost in Yeshua, in Jesus. It is not meaning that if you have a cowardly thought, if you're afraid at any point in time, that, that you're out. Remember, you didn't do anything to earn it. You can't do anything to lose it. Okay? Question, or is that just Yes, question? no, I'm just saying they were afraid to lay down their lives. Or, they were afraid to lay down their lives. You know, they, they counted the cost of this world. They didn't want to lay down their life in this world. They don't have their life. Yeah. But those who lay down their life in this world have resurrected life. Yes. Roger, a little bit air for us for the end, please. The next word is unbelieving. I think that's very clear. That's the faithless ones. Hebrews 11, 6 addresses that also. We'll run there real quick. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. If you don't want to go there, I'll read it to you real quickly. It says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. I don't get it. I don't know how, but there are literally those who do not believe in God. So there is no God. Now, some who say that, <laughs> watch them and you'll catch them in your own life. But apparently there are those who literally believe that there is no God. They are the unbelieving. They are the faithless. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. These are the ones that are unsafe for all of eternity. These are the ones in hell. Loretta? I'm really amazed at the White House how they have this group of atheists that they're, they're just going after any school that has God in trust. Even the little thing on the wall has been there for generations. And they're just trying to pull down. I'm just so amazed how they are trying to. They can try to shut it out, but it's there. Can, but it's like the Lord said, even the rocks will cry yes. out. Yes. It's there. They can't ever take it out. Then believing that abominable. Remember, abominable abomination is idolatry. Remember the abomination of desolations put in the temple is that image to be worshipped. So the abominable are those who are polluting this world with their ungodliness. It's by idolatry, by satanic worship. These are the ones that are not there. Okay, when I quoted for you is Matthew 24, 15, when the abomination of desolation is its place. But let me take you to Deuteronomy real quickly. Deuteronomy chapter 7 will show you how I know abomination is this idolatry. Uh, not just from Matthew, but also all the way back in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 25 and 26. Believe it or not, we are ending here. I see the clock. We really are. Um, I just want to finish that thought, you know, totally. You are to burn up completely the carved statues of their gods. Don't be greedy for the silver or gold on them. Don't take it with you or you'll be trapped by it, for it is abhorrent to Adonai, your God. You know what? I wanted to do it fast. I called it my Jewish Bible, and it doesn't have the word. Let me, sorry, I'm trying to hurry. Let me go to Deuteronomy. Chapter 7, well, I see that clock. People got schedules, and I know it. Um, Deuteronomy 7, 25 here. The graven images of their gods you burn with fire. You shall not covet the silver or gold that is in them, nor take it for yourselves, or you'll be snared by it. Here we go. For it is an abomination to the Lord your God. You shall not bring an abomination into your house, and like it come under the ban. You shall utterly detest it. You shall utterly abhor it, for it is something banned. What God was telling them is when they conquer the peoples, because nations are going to fall before them, these nations are idol worshippers. Remember, Abraham crossed over from the worship of other gods to the one true and living God. These other gods are represented by gold, by silver. They're, they're carved images. He's saying, don't, don't take it. Say, oh, you know what? I'll take it for the gold. He's saying, no. It's an abomination. I have nothing to do with it. Don't bring it into your house. If you do, you're going to be under its curse. That curse that you're putting yourself under is satanic. Satan, it is him. Because those are images of worshiping him. That's what he's doing. Anything that takes your worship away from the Lord, 
the true, the living God, is worshiping Satan. That is where it splits, folks. Every, every false religion is worshiping Satan. I don't care what you call it. I don't care what name it's given. That's where it's going. He's trying to get the worship away from God. And God was warning them, don't have anything to do with it. I'm going to hit a sore note, possibly. If I do, wear it. Take it home. If I step on your toe, I'm meaning to. If you have a Buddha or a, you have a, an idol that you pick up when you travel from another country and you thought it was cool or something that you wanted to, to remember, you like the looks of it or whatever, for whatever reason, I'm appalled at how many times I've gone into homes of believers that have something like this there. Mm -mm. I cringe, not because of me, but because of the Word of God. Don't take it into your house. If you've got it, trash it. Don't give it away. Don't give it to someone else. That's out of the pit of hell. Get rid of it. Clean your house out. Anyone who is participating with idols, God's saying they're not the inheritors of eternal life with me. If they're worshiping something else, they're not with me. They don't have faith in me. He's separating those who do and those who don't. Yes. All mean stuff. Same thing. A lot of it, yes. 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 Absolutely. And they Just, don't even know they, they have they these don't. little witches and stuff in their house. Dragons. And, and, and from yeah. Halloween, and they don't even know. They don't realize. But yes. Yes. Do they still hold accountable even though they don't know? I think I will bring it to their attention. And again, we're talking now about those who, this is a practice. This is their way of life. They've rejected the Lord, and they have. Their faith in this, because you put faith in something. You really don't live without faith. You put faith in something. Yeah. So, yeah. So those who are involved in Satan worship, the sorcerers, sorcerers were involved in the occult. If that's who their God is, they will be in like a fire forever. They will not be in heaven. Liars. You know what? I should have stopped. The zodiac. The zodiac. The fake. The zodiac is the fake. I can't. I can finish it. We'll look up the verses later because we'll get this when we come back next week. But um, the the zodiac is the false. Remember, all Satan does is counterfeit. The astronomy, the gospel of stars, was counterfeiting with the zodiac. And yes, zodiac opens up to the false also. Stay away from it. And liars. Liars are not in heaven. Why does this thrill me no end? How did it all start? What are we being guaranteed? History will not repeat itself. It's not going to start again and again and again. Never will a lie come in. Never will it be a false truth. You know, if, if you're in a relationship with somebody, they got a great relationship with them, but then they lie to you, what does it do to that relationship? <clears throat> it does. It shakes it to its very core. They can do something else, and it can be repairable far easier. But when they lie, then the next time they're talking to you, what's the first thing that creeps up in your mind? Maybe they're lying again. It, it just undermines it all. That's what Satan did. He undermined it all with a lie. He brought it all crashing down with a lie. And we are promised. No, a lie is a lie is a lie is a lie. No little white lies. We will look at the verses next week in First John. I just want to run for the sake of the video. First John 2, 22 and First John 5, verses 10 through 13 deals with this. We will talk about how Satan will not be able to affect, infect, whatever. The, the lie will not touch it. The Lord is confirming to us and blessing us with the fact that forever and ever and ever and ever it will be glorious. Hallelujah. So come back next week. We're going to see again the description of the bride. Um, I didn't even need to bring it yet. We'll, we will get into this. We honestly will. I thought for sure we were going to get into it. We'll talk about being in the spirit. We'll talk about the foundations. We'll talk about the walls. We'll talk about the gates. we got a whole lot to talk about. But that's where we'll start. Oh. You know what? We can do it next week, even though you called it up. Patty's got for us when faith goes to market, but considering it's so late, why don't we start with that next week? For sure. Wait till people don't get the, they get stopped. It's not long, right? You know, it's just uh, one sentence that I see here. Oh, well, I've got longer than that, but go ahead, read the one sentence there. I'll bring up the rest of it, and I'll search for it. It just says, when faith goes to market, it always takes a basket. Okay, and that is just, there is, there's one that describes the market that you go to. 
I will find it for next week. Okay. okay. You try it, I'll try two, and we'll see who comes up with it. Okay, Patty? Michelle, I think it's a freaking mile. Close. 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 Also, something that I, we, I took a, a class on Dungeons and Dragons and Ouija boards. Those are oh, that's all I love today. Games yeah. and that kind of stuff. Yeah. If, if you all have grandchildren, yeah. yes, it's know. teaching them it's occultic ways yes. and it's teaching them to be open to it. This is most of the Okay. We've already taught their series. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think it's still going. What, what more can we say? I think we have said we have covered. Yes, these yes, are things to stay away from. Right. Don't participate. It's not that you can lose your salvation, but those who don't have salvation, it certainly is the trap that keeps them away. And we don't want it. And, you know, oh, well, they, they've got that, and they're a Christian. It must be okay. You know, stay away from all appearances of evil. Okay? Any closing comments, questions? Are we good? My apologies for going so late. I hope you've been blessed. I learned something that I never did before in the Garden of Eden. We were talking about death. In the Garden of Eden, that the reason, you know, when they were showing out the gate, the angel had to stand there to make it clear clear the gate and not come back. Because if they eat of the, of the tree of life, they would live eternally in the in a sinful state. And yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> God did not put that <laughs> sentence on us. Hallelujah. And it is a verse. Yes. The other day. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's a good point. Okay. Let's close in prayer. Lord God, again, we thank you for the promises, sure and true, for the fact that you are faithful, you are true, you are living, you are our God, we are your people, we belong to you forever. Lord, we can hardly wait till we're in your presence to worship you and to, to just be with you forever and ever, but Lord, this is our chance to serve you, so let us go out, let us be stronger in our spirits, let us be reflectors of you better. Because of this class, Lord, let this time count. Let us bring more into this special family for all of eternity. And thank you that soon and very soon we will see you face to face. Lord, bless and be with all, meet every need, and bring us back together safely if you haven't taken us on first. In your precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, thank you. My apologies. Long class. <laughs> Yeah, I'm used to it. I don't know why I have that part of it.